So, from present reality to future scenario vision. So, when we take any ecosystem starting point and from the maturity, um, like looking at those ecosystem maturity phases that we, we covered, I think, in module one, um, <clears throat> we basically have the data that becomes information, that becomes knowledge, and that becomes wisdom. So first we have just knowing what's happened, who, what, when, where, and then, then understanding how, and, and, and really understanding how these things happen. So understanding those processes that could, could contribute, and, and, and through data visualization and so forth, and finally having wisdom. So understanding why. So why does these things work and look the way they do? So the typical mapping exercise is the, the beginning part, and then we have the orchestration level. So the, 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 the later maturity of the ecosystem um, development phase where there is uh, more wisdom in place. But the key thing here, again, as a reminder to understand is that, again, it's not only about about understanding better about and not only about the reporting perspective into data to, to know the numbers the kpis but all the other things that uh, the data can actually do so the automation of things so getting back to that uh, whole point of developing anything around ai or improving any of those processes to automate any of those processes needs that data to function so it needs data triggers to improve the automation and uh, and that automation doesn't have to wait until the ecosystem reaches maturity level but it's something that should happen uh, following the, the initial phases uh, early on because it also starts to contribute uh, more volume of data different type of data, new types of data and information that will then also contribute towards the wisdom uh, faster. So really to get to, to this level of, of uh, uh, digitalization, um, you can already ask many things from Siri, you can ask many things from you know, Alexa in Amazon, but you can't ask questions like this. And the only reason the system can do whatever the system it is designed to do, but it can't do if it doesn't have the right data to work with. So, so to get to this type of information, the, the, the pain needs to be faced from the data side and the, the, the software connectivity side first. So the automation part uh, can be spread to many different uh, levels as well. From simple moving one data record from one system to another, uh, or to trigger, you know, if there is, if uh, event is full, to, to notify people that maybe we need to, you know, create another similar event uh, and, and schedule that earlier than, than later, or whatever that may be. And at the heart of everything, we have been discussing standards in many different levels. Um, we have discussed standards in terminology. We have discussed, discussed standards in the, the framework format. Uh, we have discussed standards in the context of KPIs uh, to have comparable uh, data, to have comparable measures. Um, and of course, when we talk about standards, we also talk in the context of data. So again, we need to avoid uh, creating bigger or smaller silos. We already have silos in every ecosystem in, in so many different levels. Uh, I think we discussed about those earlier, the types of silos we have. And um, the, the, one of the biggest points that we want to communicate uh, because we work uh, as a globally neutral actor with any ecosystem who wants to make progress in these areas is to do not create a national silo. <clears throat> so don't create a silo around your city 
just to get the standards to work within your city. Don't create a national silo to just create models that are applicable in your uh, national level. Or don't create, if you are a multinational organization, don't create standards that only re reflect your uh, your business vertical when it comes to data about innovation, startups, progress, investments, things that are uh, cross-cutting through any vertical. You can create your own standards in the context of your vertical, uh, but make sure that that becomes a standard with other, even your competing vertical actors, because otherwise you lose uh, the, the, the benefits of commons because the models and standards are different than the actual data that is then cycling through because of those standards. <clears throat> so really to co-create global ecosystem connectivity standards. And this is, this is of course, the, the type of world we live because of the historical perspective of how these very physical infrastructure um, solutions have built their standards and there has been you know competing standards for whatever reason and we also know uh, and really experience the benefits of, of global standards whether it's our mobile phones or whether it's the wi-fi so um, so really to understand the, the benefits of building global standards <clears throat> so in a round of data we discuss about open standards around data models. So really bringing the interoperability, aggregation, comparability and automation capabilities because of the open standards uh, data. And we'll dive deeper later on into what, how does that look in practice, but we'll, we'll look at some other elements before that. But really uh, open standard means that uh, it's not controlled, it's not meant to be controlled by any individual country or organization, public or private, uh, but it's more like open source software. Building a, a common standard that everyone benefits from and everyone can contribute from and having an open con uh, governance model around that, similar to what we discussed about ecosystem forum and ecosystem operator governance models in the previous module but having that around specifically having a, in its ecosystem, having their own teams looking at this and then aggregating that conversation uh, at the global level. And that's a one area where we are orchestrating and contributing heavily because we understand and know this is a key factor for everyone. Uh, but we are also hopeful that uh, as things mature in more ecosystems, uh, we have to be less and less uh, responsible of pushing that agenda while we still want to contribute for those standards to, to follow because it's, it's a requirement for uh, everyone's collective and accelerating benefits uh, in their own ecosystem developments. So, <clears throat> because in this module we're focusing on the digital transformation, we really have to go through uh, some of the really basic um, um, terminologies and, and uh, key meanings of what digital transformation actually is about and uh, to really get the, the essence of that. And a, a key piece is to really understand the digital economy in its all of its uh, kind of uh, scale and size and understand some of the challenges, why aren't we there then yet? Like why some industries move faster, some move slower? And, uh, and, and why isn't this, like if it's all logical, then why isn't it actually already happening? And uh, the perspective I like to, to give uh, here as an analogy is, is how we see applications and how we see um, as, as when we look at as users, as consumers, uh, as individuals using applications and software, whether it's, you know, even offline software, it's the same thing, but the, specifically when we should look at software online. 
um, we really see that you know we see it all through the user interface. So we see you know whatever the interface is that is given Facebook, LinkedIn, Google, Trello, you know CRM. We understand the software and the digital world through that lens. We see email. We see you know PDF file, um, and and that really changes our perspective. Like you know, or it doesn't change. It's just how without thinking is, is that the majority of people how they understand digital economy is what they see. And internet is like, you know, there's one application, I go there and I can do things, I go to another one, I can I go there and I do things. But what happens behind the scenes is actually what the real digital economy is all about. It doesn't mean that the, you know, the other side wouldn't be included. But the point is that uh, behind the scenes is the software features, is the data, is the real digital economy, and and the other the related terminologies are one that is API economy, data economy, platform economy, and typically this is more common for developer users uh, to connect other applications with other uh, to make applications to communicate it with other and. Also, the key piece there is like, similarly as we as consumers uh, or normal users go to register into a new application, we are given the terms of use or the terms you know, that we have to accept. We just go there, click and access granted. So, but we don't really, like we don't read them. We don't really think of them too much. Um, and it's actually so, it's, it's of course also a big problem in today's world, but regardless, uh, <clears throat> there is a way for me as a customer to make an agreement with the service that I'm using with the one tick box and a click. And the service for, for reasons we already uh, understand and can understand, they want that to be very seamless and efficient. Like think if every single user would have to negotiate and agree about the types of terms, uh, like like imagine it as a like an offline offline sales process about an insurance or a bank relationship that is now replaced with tick box and click yes. So that's the level. It's not only the digital efficiency. It's what all of those things that happen because of that. So in the digital economy, when when looking at the application connectivity, there also needs to be business terms. So technical B2B user business terms. And that also can be at a click of a button instead of this, you know, negotiate sale type of process of do you give access what data would you like to have and like i'm not sure i have to ask for my boss and you know uh well we got this and we can give this we can't give this and the other says well then that's not useful for me and you know there's a whole thing that needs to be put in a you know click a box here's the terms you can use it this way if you consume more than that you have to start paying if you use these can you openly, these you have to get a separate permission, apply here, submit, approved, you know, that's how the connectivity and the digital economy works behind the scenes. So, but because of how majority of uh, those who are not, you know, software companies and digital act actors, uh, typically, majority of these applications that are currently in place, they are technically and practically not open for business. So only the, you know, the normal users who the applications are designed for, it's open and it's working, but the whole digital, the bigger part of the digital economy is not open for business with that application or with that company, with that application or with that company, with that service or that public sector actor with that support function. It's basically the only way to interact is meant for the normal users. And of course, there are companies who have created, uh, you know, and techniques to, to make it work, even if it's not technically open, but what is
is not in place at that time, regardless if they use some other technical means like website scraping with software scripts reading, you know, the user interface, there is no business terms because the software was never meant to be used that way, that they could check a box and say, I can feel comfortable that they can interact that data and use that data that way. So <clears throat> API economy and data economy um, means the certain user groups and it means the types of tools to make things open for them. Majority of applications in the world, technically and practically not open for business. And to, do, to change that is really to create uh, those terms, technical B2B terms, create developer documentation. So these are the rules, these are the information how you can use it. And then here's practically where you can use it. So the application programming interface. And here is a list of data that you can extract what's available. And technical business terms say here are the, you know, you can consume this data with these terms. And here's you can put a credit card here, or you can make an annual agreement. But it basically means that you make your software technically and practically open for business in technical B2B use cases. For developers, for other applications to connect and technical uh, B2B uh, uses to emerge, including startups building new innovations out of that data or from those software features that are available in uh, your application or application that you use. So whether you have custom-made software or whether you are using uh, ex existing softwares, uh, whether you are buying software as a service, um, these are the same questions that you need to think, is our service, is our business technically and practically open for business in a digital economy? So <clears throat> this is the transition, the, 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 the what enables the digital economy to grow when more and more choose to be more open and design uh, connectivity under the user interface. So not what happens in the user interface, but what happens in the logistic system. You know, what happens in the value chain between actors in technical level, directly between applications uh, and reuse of data uh, recreating new models by merging and combining data from multiple services and so forth. So more technical perspective into what we in previous model uh, looked, moving from applications to pipes, moving the mindset from application centric mindset to data and value exchange and connectivity centric mindset. So really thinking of and understanding what that digital economy means and it's full scale. And what are, there isn't, there isn't too many terms to pay attention uh, to really understand what's happening. So moving into this world to have the application programming interface, APIs available uh, and having data to, to move and software features to move um, between applications. And then it's a separate question between what applications and to, with how many applications. But the minimum requirement is that if the application is not designed to be available, by definition, it's not available. And others can't uh, build new opportunities because of that. So missing a whole segment of extremely valuable um, use cases and users. So <clears throat> when we look at startup ecosystems, then from another perspective, uh, more from the business operational perspective, moving away from data for a while, we look at the organizations uh, in the ecosystem we typically have, uh, whether it's a, you know, a co-working space full of startups, whether it's a support function, whether it's a, you know, 
government call center around company registration. Uh, we have the back office functions where things happen. We have the middle office, we have those who run the processes, uh, those who look at the rules and you know how the organization works, uh, what are the you know the do's and don'ts and instructions, guidelines, you know, different things. And then we have the front office where you know the people interact and, and face the, the service or the organization uh, to, to, to enter. And uh, you can put any organization here. It can be you know public sector, you can put you know a multinational giant company here. Uh, the key is that majority of organizations are analog. So by analog, we mean that uh, everything is run and the digital, how they see, is based on the user interfaces from the perspective of how they understand um, and how the information is moved. It moved one people, one person takes a report out of a system and then goes and communicates to another person or sends through an email and this other person consumes that information through however it was you know sent or packaged of course there are applications that are you know shared among like the crms or or whatnot but typically there are also multiple applications that in the organization that are not communicating with each other and therefore uh, information is passed through people and they are you know offline software uh, SaaS software uh, and, and so forth. But the analog analogy comes that a majority of the information actually goes through people and, uh, and, and, and that's an analog organization. Even if it's a, you know electronic PDF, doesn't make it a, a, a digitally operating organization. So typically it means that if the organization is built such that um, the technical tools are built just to help run the manual processes in a digital format, where the key part of the process is, is information passing from people to people directly. It, it's not a uh, it's it's a very analog organization. And when we talk about uh, the digital transformation, uh, it really means that everything that happens in the organization is similarly as we talk at ecosystem level that information is primarily moving through application to application directly and then people have different interfaces to see that so whether it's an accounting system or the crm system that information doesn't go from you know accounting to crm through people it goes from accounting to crm directly and then people have different views and they have different tasks to, to work with that application or to pull information from that application, regardless of whether it's from product management, whether it's from accounting, whether it's from CRM, they have their own interface where they can pull any of that information. That's how it looks in practice when it's a digital organization. Now you can all think of well, how many digital organizations there are in the world that not only build digital products and solutions externally to others that they sell, but are actually internally digital as well. So they are not only building digital business, they are operating digitally uh, enabled organization. And of course, ecosystem goes broader, but uh, but ecosystem is then connecting these different applications across uh, different organizations. But if you take a big organization like multinational, they have you know, country offices, they have different functions, they have even multiple offices in the same city. Uh, it's not that different, but how they build their systems is very different. So the key example is that we can think, but you can think of any of the you no know, Facebooks and Googles and Amazons and Microsofts and Apple. They don't run internally either in the analog format. 
So that perspective applies to all ecosystem functions collectively and individually. And that's what the digital transformation really needs to um, start coping is that where to start and where to end is when there is no longer those uh, manual information passing processes in place where it can be done directly and automatically. <clears throat> and uh, understanding that uh, we started why uh, to go into more technical things uh, and for some uh, from, the ecos uh, from the ecosystem development perspective or ecosystem builder perspective you may feel that uh, well this is too technical for me this is technical stuff this is something that belongs to developers this is something that uh, that I should not need to worry and that's exactly what digital transformation is about everyone needs to worry and everyone needs to understand this at a uh, deep enough level but also high enough level so don't need to go needing to be a programmer don't need to know how to code don't need to know how to maintain servers but to understand actually what is happening on the technology side and the other key piece is that also those who are technical people who are programmers software creators you know the technical system administrators they may think well i don't need to know about ecosystems i don't need to really you know know about innovation entrepreneurship and startups and so forth unless they want to build one of their own but it's exactly the opposite if they work in ecosystem development they do need to understand uh, the applications the different actors the terminology because that's the only way um, we build the type of knowledge that can solve these challenges and that's the same problem uh, in any organization like outside of ecosystem let's take, take a you know shipping industry logistics industry those who know the software and it typically don't know that much about the industry itself because they think they don't need to know and on the other hand uh, those who you know work with the logistics you know the most cost effective way to ship a product from a to b think that i don't know how to know how the system works i just need to be you know shipping products but the key thing is to be able to develop that requires people that can um, understand both sides to be really effective uh, because a lot of the, the, the challenges in digital transformation goes into uh, lost in translation. So meaning that uh, the, the, the operation, the non-technical side is unable to communicate clearly enough what and why and how things need to be changed for the technical people to be able to do that. Or on the other side, the technical people are unable to communicate what's actually relevant from the business operations perspective and why. And uh, in the ecosystem, in the, in the innovation entrepreneurship ecosystem context, uh, we want to make sure that the level that we communicate these topics are able to bridge both sides and we put it in digital format and visual format to help bring and bridge these silos together as well to improve the overall capability of developing the ecosystem, whether it starts from support functions to ecosystem level to digital orchestration to application to data to automation. We don't go as deep as starting to talk individual, you know, software languages or programming code snippets. Uh, we don't go that deep. We also don't go into explaining how business model canvas work we don't go into level of uh, opening up um, you know accounting systems so but we do bridge all of the key knowledge through the framework to make sure that it connects and you can from any ecosystem development role whether it's technical or non-technical 
you can kind of get the whole big picture uh, built um, if, 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 if having enough con commitment to consume the knowledge and then research any topics deeper if needed. So <clears throat> we're all used to thinking the, uh, or, or communicating that we have two sides of the brain. You know, we have the more creative side and then we have the more analytical side. And uh, we used to think of like it's arts and uh, mathematics and, uh, and, and this is how our brains work. And, and so in the, when we talk in this context of building the digital transformation mindset and we talk about business context and ecosystem context, we're talking about understanding the business mechanics, economic mechanisms on the creative side and why they are on the creative side is because they don't have to match always. You look at any ecosystem and the KPIs, you look at any you know, business accounting, there's creative accounting done there. But when it comes to data, it only works if it's like really ones and zeros. And the more we have teams who share this knowledge, the more we have individual people who share this capability and knowledge to bridge these two worlds is where um, the talent for digital transformation emerge. So the digital transformation is dependent on finding a right way to communicate between business functions and technical functions and having um, uh, teams that are capable of handling those like teams of two, teams of five, teams of ten, and all the way to the point of having uh, individuals who can handle both sides. And uh, again, this is not specific to uh, startup ecosystems or ecosystem perspective. This is the same challenge in every single organization that are trying to convert themselves into digital economy that there is not, not enough teams and people who can effectively understand the business that they are in, the customers they work with, and apply digital methods to improve the processes and information flow. And, uh, and, and therefore, also, when we talk about individual startups, uh, they're, they're those who are capable of building the innovation as a team, having the technical side, the business side, and the, the design side, the create, even the creative side, as a team, uh, that's one of the reasons why they can be super powerful organizations having this digital DNA in their organization from the beginning. So this one slide is very much where the, the, the limitations struggles, challenges, but also the opportunities of digital transformation lies, is to have more minds that can build digital businesses, think digital businesses, digital processes, digital operations, and, uh, and in the sense of not limiting to what the user interface communicates. So, <clears throat> The most notable uh, organization in the world that has gone through this transformation and how it went through was Amazon. Uh, and we can all see the, the, how Amazon continues to state new industries and new enter into new markets, whether it's geographically or industry-wise. Uh, there's something like we all know that Amazon started from you know, the, the bookstore and e-commerce store and we see the outside. But what happened inside Amazon, internal organization, 2002, 17 years ago, is when Bezos sent, this is an official letter uh, that he sent internally in the organization. This, you can Google it, it's, it's a lot of the same, exact same, it's available many places. Uh, used as a case example to, to many different perspectives. But basically saying that all teams will henceforth expose their data and functionality through a service interface. So meaning that 
not through people, not communicated manually, but through a service interface. Teams must communicate with each other through these interfaces. So no from me to you through person to person uh, communication for anything that needs to be like you know accurate. We can of course brainstorm, we can you know communicate what that means, but not the actual like this is the factual data. There will be no other form of in inter-process communication allowed. No direct linking, meaning that I'll send you this link. No direct read of other teams' data store. No shared memory model, no backdoors whatsoever. The only communication allowed is via service interface calls over the network. So basically meaning that I can't give access to my interface that I'm using as when my role is you know, accounting or I'm in shipping. I can't give access to my interface. I will have a separate interface communicating to your interface and you will get that information that is relevant to you through your own interface. That's what it means. And the key here was also that it doesn't matter what the technology is in question. He didn't say use Microsoft, use you know, uh, this open source, don't use open source. It's just not relevant. The key is removing the factual information transfer, transfer, transferring from people to people and only through systems. All service interfaces without exception must be designed from the ground up to be external, externalizable. That is to say that the team must plan and design to be able to expose the interface to developers in outside of the world. No exceptions. So open by design, open for business in digital economy. Doesn't mean that you can access Amazon's internal data but if they want at any point that they can open that data technically just by deciding to do so. And it also doesn't matter then whether you are official part of internal Amazon organization or if you're a subcontractor or you're part of the logistic chain, they can have access to that information if, it, if it's beneficial. And there's a separate business term to that. And if it's something that keeps repeating, it's standard agreement. And that's how you can get access. So, and then showing the, the true Jeff Bezos action is like anyone who doesn't do this will be fired. So just making it very clear that that's going to happen. But the point is that this did happen 17 years ago. And that's what a digital organization look, looks like. And of course, it's not meant that things need to be done this harsh, but in the private sector, someone can push the, the change through motivation or through the, the financial incentives of taking the money away if people don't do. And that's a separate question, whether that's right or wrong, or who should do it, who should not do it, how to do it. That's not the point. The point is about uh, clear examples. So when we look at the Amazon, Amazon effect, um, so that means like when Amazon, not only as introducing new products or services, by the way, the, 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 this transferred to AWS, so the, the, the Amazon cloud services, when they built everything for internal use, and then they decided to open, not the data, but the methods that they use internally to, as an external product, that's what created AWS uh, business uh, eventually. So all of their cloud business is based on um, that they said rent the infrastructure and build the solutions is, is, is coming from the internal learnings what they actually drive their own organization. But Amazon in fact is, uh, is basically um, looking at the lens of what happens when Amazon moves to another industry because all the, the global investors understand uh, the, 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 what really runs the Amazon uh, efficiency in that sense. So 
This is the Amazon effect when they bought um, Whole Foods. They bought the, it was the, the, the healthy uh, uh, national consumer uh, or grocery store chain in US, one of the biggest one and, and uh, healthy food. So they, uh, they bought Amazon. Amazon bought the Whole Foods, and this is what happened to all of the big um, uh, other uh, grocery chains in their stock market. So you have Costco, you have Walmart, you have Kroger, you have Target. This was when Amazon announced, so there was immediate market fix on what does that mean in the, in the value of uh, those other companies when a digitally native organization enters to their business. They haven't even done anything yet, it's just that they bought Whole Foods and they're entering to that industry now. So when they announced the Whole Foods, um, it was 13.7 billion all cash deal shares of grocery store. Uh, Chain Grover slid 9.2%, Costco 7.2%, uh, Target 5.2%, Walmart 4.6%. And uh, actually, what, what ended happened uh, was that uh, Amazon's stock price raised more than what they paid for the Whole Foods chain. So practically, they got that for free. And actually, I think even Jeff Bezos' own portion grew more than, than, than it was, but there are more facts out there. But the, the point is to, to what is the impact of, of an organization, digitally native organization moving to another industry that is not digitally disrupted yet at scale. 